Good, on, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, WorkSafe, for having me here. Um, I'll start off. So I'm a director of property risk management at the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage. I'm not a occupational hygienist. I'm not a scientist. I act as a landowner and a land manager on behalf of the state. So under Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage, we're in the lands bit of it, so it's crown land. So the rough numbers are 92% of the state is crown land. What we're on right now is crown land. The river's crown land, most of your parks, reserves, and then pretty much Dr. Martin Ralph's map showing where all those radioactive mine sites are, that's Crown land, essentially. So every part outside a major metropolitan area is Crown land and has some level of risk, contamination or issue on it. So I've got a quite an extensive portfolio and a quite a, 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 a knowledgeable team working on it. So we've got the, under that, a contaminated sites team that deals with the contaminated sites on unmanaged land where there's no other authority responsible for the contamination or it's a legacy issue. So You've got abandoned mines, you've got uh, in industries that are long bygone, tanneries and battery sites, state battery sites, those kind of things, where there's no one else responsible for the cleanup of those sites. It comes into, by default, the Minister for Lands portfolio and then by default to myself. So it's, it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of it out there and it's, and it's kind of legacy and big stuff. So we don't always know what's out there until we actually get to a site and there's a lot of them as well, as you can imagine. Um, so I'll just... That's me. So Whitnoom, for those who don't know or not from the area, so Whitnoom is located about 14,000, 1,400 kilometres from Perth, uh, 200 kilometres north of Newman. It is a quint it was a quintessential mining town. So Whitnoom existed as an evolution of mining in the area. So at first it was your workers' camps, your tent kind of tent setups, and evolved into a town inside the gorge next to the mine sites, and then moved out into the the floodplain outside the gorge itself. Um, it was at its peak one of the biggest Pilbara towns and most vibrant. You can't really see in that first picture there, but it had its own bus service, school service, mail, airports. Um, it, it was a big kind of town like you would look at your Newmans of today and, and those and the likes up there. Uh, at its peak, there's anywhere between 10 and 20,000 people in and around Whitnam area, both working and residing in there. So it, it has touched a lot of lives. As Jeff pointed out, everyone has a kind of story of someone who's been there, school excursions, worked there, and the legacy is quite... It's quite extensive in WA and Australia, to be honest. So there's a bit of a timeline there. It's probably a bit small to, uh, hopefully you can have a look at later on the slide. So asbestos was found in the ranges in the turn of the century in the early 1900s. Um, it's quite a hard area to get to. Obviously back then it's your horse and your carts and your kind of camel trains and then moving on to automation. So while um, asbestos was found in the ranges in the early 1900s, it wasn't until the 19, late 30s and the, uh, in the early 40s it was actually mined in a, in a quantity and a, a vast scale in Whitnoom and the, and the surrounding gorges. So we've got about a 20 year period where asbestos was mined in the gorges, so from the 40s to the 60s, so it's not a long period of time in, in the space of the mine and the mine sites, where some mine sites are 40, 50, 60 plus years, so you've got 20 years of a few different mines operating in the gorge. But in the white boxes in there, they are key points of, so in, in some of the research and, and working through this for the department and for the minister and, and, and other works, they, there is advice on, in the day about the dust issues inside the mill and the mine. So it wasn't at that stage an asbestos or asbestos related disease issue, it was a dust work safe issue. So one of them there is talking about the workers being, um, I think it's eight levels time, the safe levels of the day. So as you've heard the scientists now telling you, those levels then were nowhere near where we have them today. So if it's eight levels of the day, what does that mean for what it would have been today? Um, I'll show some pictures later. It's quite, um, you would have seen a lot of them, but it's quite extraordinary to, to have a look. Um, they did get in the 50s extra pay for working in the dust conditions. Um, I'm not sure that would, that was kind of, it was acknowledged that there was that issue. We'll, if, we'll issue further pay and try to put respirators and, and fan, extraction fans into the area. In the 60s, it became um, the following a number of health reports and mine inspection reports. It was untenable in the, in the, of, of the, the government of the day to keep. You had, sorry, your 20 years of mining. So that's your, that's your 20 year lag time. I'm not, a, I'm not a scientist or health expert, but that's your 20 year lag time between the exposure of those levels to asbestos and then most of your asbestos related diseases coming in. So there's your 20 years of now the workers are coming up chronically with these diseases time and time again. So the mine was no longer viable and the workers were, were un, unwell from the mine, so it was decided to close it, they were mining down in the 60s. It wasn't until the late 70s that the closure of the town was announced, as a decision of government of the day. Um, it wasn't until the 80s that the government decided to remove its own buildings. It wasn't until the early 2000s the government started withdrawing all power, water and other services. And it wasn't until two years ago the government decided to actually take action and remove the last residents in there. 
um, and that's part of what the work that I was um, taken over on. So the early dust issues, oops, sorry, I'm gonna change that one. So there's a 1970s article from the Sydney Tribune. That is when the workers are now taking court action for their exposure to dust levels and it's first-hand accounts of workers having respirators that don't work or the respirators themselves causing other work health issues of heat exposure and other issues are not fitting properly and there's other causes of, of work health concern in there. That is the crushing of ore and there's, in those two pictures there. So that is the, the main gorge, that's the main mine site there. You can see the dust clouds and that was constantly in all the references of you drive into the gorge and there's a dust cloud that hangs over the operations there. So you can see that it's a dust was an issue from pretty much the get-go of crushing and milling of the ore in the site there. Um, the 1959 annual report from the Public Health Department expressed con particular concern about the numbers of Whitney men affected by asbestos and the relatively young age and extreme short dust exposure. So that's 1959, 1960. So there's your lag, 10, 10, 15 years of this operating and then it's really coming to the fore for the government. So there's um, some, uh, you, a lot of people would have seen these uh, uh, images. So there's, in the top left we've got the first picture is your miners putting loose asbestos fibres into a hessian bag. So that's after the, the ore's been crushed, the fibres have been milled out of it, it's ready to be exported and that's those hessian bags were shipped around to, your, to other places to be used in, in, in its product as it, as it was. So you can clearly see the workers there are in stubbies with no other protection on uh, at all and that was a typical work environment in the, in the mill and the packing, packing sheds in there and those are the guys who it impacted the most directly and along in the mine site. There's two young boys in there playing, and, and then you've got tailings being used throughout the town site. So it got mentioned before that Capel had spreading of tailings. We knew had spreading of tailings. Here's a mine product, it's a good product, we should use it everywhere in the town. Sammy can talk to it a bit more as well, but it was used extensively in the town site just as a foundation and something to keep the heat off and to keep the place stable. Uh, those two young boys died in their 30s from mesothelioma. Um, the golf course on the bottom left, some, um, to mention that the Capel golf course, the Whitnam golf course and the race course were made from asbestos tailings. So people who were then having their leisure activities are doing it on asbestos tailings with fibres in it. And that bottom right one is a workers' competition to see who could fill barrels of asbestos fibres the quickest. So most of those men passed away early age of mesothelioma as well. So it's, it wasn't just the workers, it was that it was the town was pretty much built using tailings in every aspect of life. So those Hessian bags were put on the back of flatbed trucks and transported from Whitnoom throughout to most ports in the area and most rail, uh, transport networks. So along the way, you can, it's a bit hard to see in that middle picture. They weren't strapped down, they weren't tied down, they just chucked on Hessian bags. They fell off a lot on the way or you'd have truck crashes and they'd leave asbestos bags behind. So that's, those pictures are taken from Thruna and some earlier works they did with them on some of the road network up there. They are what's left behind in the past couple of years of the Hessian bags. The Hessian has deteriorated, leaving the asbestos behind, and it's quite a stable product that it's just sat there for about 60-odd well, years in, in that form. So these, these are found when they're doing main roads and roadworks in the area. You're grading along, and you hit an asbestos find, and now you've got an asbestos-contaminated work site, which you didn't know you had before. Um, and you still have all the same PPE requirements, but you probably weren't aware of that when you're doing your main roads or your roads works. Um, so that's, it's, a, it's a find that's spread it not just from the use of the tailings, but it's actually been spread throughout the transport network incidentally, so things falling off trucks and being left behind. So that's the Whitnewman Asbestos Management Area. So that's the, a contaminated site under the Contaminated Sites Act. So that's its, its, its current boundaries. So it's, it's, it's the biggest contaminated site in the Southern Hemisphere in terms of size and, and quantity, so it's 46,000 46, hectares. The underlying tenure and the reason kind of it's with the department is it's all Crown land now. So it's a mix of Crown lands, roads, reserves and unallocated Crown land with some mining tenure mixed over it as well. So you still have active mine tenure sitting over it, but it's not, it's now no longer owned privately. It's all government held now. And the, and the boundary where people hold the native title rights for the area as a recognised traditional owner. So they as a people are the most impacted group or class from, from the health side of things of, of exposure to, to asbestos and, and living in, in that area. So it is a major concern for the Bandrama people and we are working with them as to, as to long-term strategies for, for Whitnoom and the surrounding areas. So my role in this, so I took over the role in about two and a half years ago, so the state was still negotiating with private landowners, there were still three landowners at that stage who held land privately in Whitnoom. So with your state's property rights, the government can't just come in and take your land off you unless it's for a public work, you might have seen the movie The Castle, those kind of things. The state will try to negotiate with you, reach a fair outcome. If it's not able to, it compulsory acquire, if it's for the greater public good. 
Now, with Whitnoom, we couldn't, under the current legislation, the frameworks of, of then anyway, um, acquire that property because it wasn't a direct public work as if it's a road, a railway, water pipes, etc. So, special act of parliament was required, the Whitnoom Closure Act. It allowed for the acquisitions of the properties as if it was for a public work, and it put compensation amounts for those properties as well. So, we end up having one last round of negotiations. So, of the three, one last landowner. Uh, um, gave it by agreement, and then two still kind of held out, they didn't want to go, and one was a resident up there. So we acquired the properties, gave time frames to move on, um, still a lot of back and forthing of that, and then the government had to acquire the properties and take further actions to kind of, to, with using the sheriff and that kind of measure to, to forcefully take hold of the properties. Um, it's just the message wasn't getting through. People were still travelling there, caravanning there, staying in the homes that were still there, getting them rented, backpackers, caravans, so every time we were hearing and seeing pictures on social media, people caravanning there with their kids, and people camping in the gorges with no PPE, thought, Sean's thoughts, driving on the tailings, sightseeing on the trailings, camping on the tailings. So this is direct exposure and passing it around, and, and, and it's just quite phenomenal. So I know you're kind of in the space here, but for the general public, there's just not a lot of knowledge of what Nittnum was and the current risks it posed. And I actually had a few people post to me, well, if I can drive there in a day, what's the risk? You could actually drive all the way to the tailings with, no in, with just a warning of asbestos sign. So that was the government's decision to actually take some action here and actually really close the site down. So we acquired all the properties now for the first time since Whitman was founded, they're all state owned. We went through a tender process for demolition of the above ground infrastructure remaining. So all the mining, the mining equipment had been removed in the decade before. This was now just talking about the residential town side of what was left behind in the private dwellings. Um, so we um, put it out to tender, but the tender was situated, uh, not situated, sorry, but focusing on WHS. So this wasn't a a value for money proposition as such, that was one of the criteria, but it was the WHS. So as the landowner and as a employer, I have an obligation on the WHS Act to send someone up there and I'm responsible for what they do and their management plans as well, as long as, and, and as an employer as well on that contractor. So we had a panel with some other key state agencies working with us on that one to, to look at all the tenders and, and it was based on those assessments. And from that, uh, Thuruna Services with their with their submission was appointed and they had done some work in the area as well, so we were familiar with it. So it wasn't a learning exercise for people to go up to Whitnam and try to figure out how to do demolition. It was the fact that we needed people who are appropriately licensed um, and know how to do the work and have examples of doing that work. So we had a few tenders um, treating it and it wasn't a regular demolition or remediation job. It's not a remediation job at, at all. It was a demolition in a contaminated environment. So traditionally, if, it's, if you're demoing asbestos containing materials, you remove those materials before you do the demolition, whereas here we had to get work safe and we met with the, with the Commissioner and, and Sally at that time as well to, to work through what it would mean in this environment to work outside the regular rules. So the rules aren't written for somewhere like Whitman where you're working in this massively contaminated environment with contaminated materials. It's written for in your regular workplaces where you're removing a contaminant. So we, there's a lot of nuances in those contracts and the work schedules and it was something that I hopefully don't have to repeat again, but it was, uh, it was, it was quite difficult. Um, period in time to work through. There was a lot of media around it as well, a lot of emotion around it. Um, so we're navigating that with the Minister's office, the Premier's office, as well as with the residents and keeping them informed of the work we could and couldn't do. So it's quite an effort. We um, finally got there, but you can see from, from its, it's, like everyone's talking about looking back in history. So it's 100 years ago that pretty much the mines were started up and we're only just now really dealing with that legacy of, of Whitnam and what it's left behind. And everyone's got a story that they're linked to, so it's good to actually finally bring a closure to that part of it and then look at the, at the greater, greater job up there. So I'll pass you on to Samuel now. He can give you a rundown of the work they did on behalf of the state in the demolition of those buildings and the um, appropriate measures he had in place to work in that contaminated environment. Just following on from Josh, it's a bit of a, a different a different site to uh, to work on, and you're, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a few slides first that are a little bit wordy, and then I'll go into some photographs and a bit of video. I think one of the videos aren't working, but it's okay. So basically, our scope of work was not a traditional removal um, remediation job. Uh, not only were we working in a contaminated site our facilities had to be located within the Whitnoom Asbestos Management Area. So the boundary from Whitnoom to the edge of the Whamma is about 14.6 kilometres. So traditionally what we'd do is we'd set up our decontamination units and, and, and facilities on the border 
and we'd send our staff in with PP, etc. This was very different, where we actually had our site office and facility set up within the actual contaminated area itself, and we zoned those off to to work out which areas were safe and which areas we had to be wearing uh, protective gear. So essentially. The scope was to demolish all remaining properties above ground, so anything below ground was not in the scope of work. So that included water tanks up on the hill, uh, water corp infrastructure, pipes, buildings, road signs, and a whole, a whole lot of uh, work required for that. Um, some of the issues were is that the, the town site itself is located about 12 kilometres from the actual old mine uh, site. So, as Josh mentioned, you get a lot of people into the, into the actual part where the tailings are camping. So, the first issue we had to identify is, uh, is anyone actually in the gorge itself? Uh, because for us to undertake our work, we actually had to block off access to the town site and also to the gorge itself. So, we did that via drones. Uh, we flew a drone from Karajini down, we flew drones from Whitman Town Site in, and then we physically drove in ourselves, which is, I'll go in through in a sec. So, quick, quick overview, project ex execution plan. This was a whole massive task. This was about an eight month um, planning project. So it's not something that we took lightly. It was about 700 pages of safety documents that related to this job. Um, obviously, procurement um, confirmed the presence of water. So what we actually needed here was we needed a lot of water. Um, there was a water corp uh, bore that was existing in the site. So some of the pre-works, we went up and we did some flow tests on the bores to check that we needed that we had enough water to do the job. And part of that part of that process was um, consulting with the traditional owners of the land. Um, the Bunjima people have a lot of activity around that area. They live on country. Um, there is a site, well, there are actually three communities that are in close proximity to Whitnam. So consultation w w was key. So you've seen the photo above. Uh, we had a bit of a smoking ceremony with the forward works crew, including obviously myself, um, to talk about cultural awareness. And we also had an online module built specifically for all of our contractors uh, to do. So essentially to come onto our site not only uh, did you have to do your module, you had to have a very clear understanding on what we're doing on country. So questions. Um, normally you'd remove material from a building and you'd go, or you'd wrap it up, you'd transport it, you put it in the ground. This particular situation, we buried it on the site. So in the initial stages of the works, you can see in the middle um, over here, we weren't sure what was in the ground, so how hard the ground was. We couldn't go out there and start digging without all our facilities in, in place. So essentially what we, we had two cell options, A and B, and we had our um, lay down yards. Now, pri uh, prior to doing this work, we undertook an extensive amount of air monitoring. And I'll go into air monitoring a little bit later because it's something that was quite unique on this particular job. Um, Barriers. Now, originally in our plan, we decided to have, um, we planned to have someone physically driving up and down the road. The problem that we faced is when you actually sit there, it's about 200 odd cars a day. And they're the people that are driving past the site. Then you get the tourists coming in, about 12 to 15 a day. So we had to physically do something about blockages. So this is the beautiful town of Whitnam with the Karajini um, range in the background. Uh, this here was where the, the, the town actually was um, before. This is a photo after we've actually demolished it. Along the front here, we created a 1.2 kilometer hard barricade. So you physically couldn't drive a vehicle in there. Uh, we had people going off through the bush, cutting through, it was unbelievable. Um, even though there was probably about 60 signs along the boundary, they still didn't understand that you couldn't actually go in there. Um, we then had to put a temporary blockage to the gorge because they were physically going around and to block cars going in. About, about three days in, we had a particular 
um, group of people um, go around the barricades and uh, go through the gorge and move all our temporary bollards. This here is a family that had a blowout on a tyre in front of the, the town of Whitnoon. So they're all outside the car, kids outside, etc. Uh, this is a common occurrence, or was a common occurrence, until we finished the project up in Whitnoon. Um, essentially, people would go in with their caravans and their kids, and we'd typically go into the gorge and find about four caravans in there. Um, some of the complexities on this particular job is we planned to have our compound. So this is our compound just outside the town. What you'll notice around the ground here is a uh, road base. So essentially, we went to set up our dome, which was our safe, um, our safe area. What was happening is, as we're digging in the ground to put our temporary footings, we hit raw asbestos within about oh, half a day. So what, it, what we did is used road base around the areas um, where we're actually needing to be safe. So here's some uh, context. The, uh, down the bottom here is our uh, safe zone, our work area, and this is the town site uh, up here, and the containment cell at the top. Decontamination was a critical part of this project. So essentially, not only did we have to keep our workers safe, we needed to, to reduce the um, possibility of transporting additional contamination outside of our, uh, our work area. So we had uh, LVs, which are uh, light vehicle spray bars, and we had heavy vehicle spray bars. So essentially, anything coming into the site was decontaminated, and anything coming out of the site was decontaminated as well. Now, Josh mentioned a little bit about location. There is literally no communication out that way. So our vehicles are fitted with satellite um, communication and phone boosters. So essentially, to make a phone call away from our dome, we need to stop the car, pull a satellite out, make a call, and pop it away. Uh, decontamination. Uh, there was some people needing to be physically on the ground outside of vehicles. Um, so they needed something to decontaminate with. That's a five-stage mobile decontamination unit set up on the boundary of our, of our work area. Now, when I talk about signs before, you can't get clearer than that. So this was literally every 20 metres going down the road, and we still had people jumping over the fence. Um, we had a lady that was camped out at the old airport um, providing a daily update on Facebook, um, flying a drone over the top of us when we were working about 10 metres above our heads. So it's quite a complex um, undertaking, but you can't be clearer than that. Um, when we talk about PPE as well, this particular photo shows some of our crew wearing PPE. That is a, that is a hood respirator um, that is powered with a battery power blower on the back. Uh, vehicles, every vehicle that went onto the side apart from one, and I'll, I'll explain that why in a second, um, had positive pressure HEPA filtered units. Um, so not only did they pump clean air into the cab, we also had a second unit that pumped air outside the cab as well. So we didn't have to worry about CO2 build up. Um, any machinery was fitted with HEPA filters as well. So not only was the supervisor cars fitted, every bit of machinery was as well. Now, when we talk about dust suppression, if you control the dust, you can control things that are in the dust. So it wasn't just asbestos that we needed to worry about. Our main dust emitter was actually the toll trucks. So the road in front of Whitnerm is the main feeder road for the Solomon Mine. So we had diesel quads coming down the road every hour and a half, and the amount of dust that would bring was horrendous. So essentially, that dome wasn't for asbestos. It was actually for the secondary issue, which was the fugitive dust that was coming off the road uh, from the trucks driving down. So to fill up our water carts, what we uh, set up was an automated system. So essentially, we wanted to reduce anyone having to leave the cab where possible. So essentially, drivers walk up, they hit a button, fills the truck, and then continue on their way. I mean, heavy vehicle, so this is basically an example of a decontamination area for a vehicle that was set up. You can imagine we're off in the bush, we're not in Perth. Um, so anything that was leaving would physically have to go through spray bars. Any material that was on uh, the trucks would drop through into the bottom of the blue metal and then um, go underneath it. 
Um, as I mentioned before, um, HEPA filtration was key. So when we talk about um, an asbestos job, we also had to consider um, CO2. So some of our supervisors were in vehicles for long periods of time. CO2 builds up in the, in the cab. So we're also scrubbing that on the way out. The unit up the top there is what's called a breathe safe um, system. And that's essentially is a, is a, double, a, double, a double setup. Now, air monitoring. Um, this was a first of its kind in the world, we, we believe. Um, so what we used was a combination of um, general dust monitoring, asbestos monitoring, real-time monitoring, and also SEM. So we had our friends over at Tetratech uh, provide the infield uh, NADA accredited laboratory. So there was a lab set up at the Oski Roadhouse um, with a benchtop SEM sent from the Netherlands. So essentially, uh, it's a unit that's about so big, worth about, about half a million dollars. And that was sent specifically up the site. Because one of the issues were, is if we had an elevated hit, we needed to know straight away was that asbestos or not. Um, and the majority of them weren't. Uh, Real-time monitor, you'll see a little bit of this coming up in the market. So we did a bit of research on, um, on a new technology that's from the UK. Essentially, what the device is designed to do is to measure uh, real time, have you got an issue? Uh, and it uses quite a complex uh, technology in the background. We do have a lot of data around that as well, which will come out paper later on. You'll notice here some of the air monitoring, and you'll see that there's multiple units set up. Um, the one with a red band was actually a gold plated filter that was used in the SEM process, and it helped them be able to see the slides a bit easier. When we talk about tailings and people driving on the tailings, part of the project was to look at background versus actual um, risk to our workers. So essentially this is some air monitoring undertaken in the gorge. People regularly drive up, these are all tire marks, tire marks on there. Uh, dust suppression, uh, dust suppression was really key on this project, both inside, out on that road, stopping the dust coming in and also doing the demolitions itself. Now, Something that's a little bit different and you probably haven't seen before is we use a proprietary foam-based product that's non-fluorinated. So essentially, as I mentioned, you control the dust. Um, you don't have emissions coming off it. So what we, what we do is we actually foam the building and then we crush the building with the foam still sitting on the structure itself. So there's actually no dust whatsoever lifting off when you're doing that demolition. As I mentioned before, there's only a couple of guys that were outside during this whole process, and typically that's the guys operating a phone uh, machine, and then some of the guys that were cleaning up, you know, smaller parts that couldn't do with machines at the end. Uh, again, dust suppression. We had a few technical issues on this job, and the, the general dust compared to the dust coming off the buildings, again, was the main issue. So when the, when the wind shifted around, We'd had the dust coming this way. And when I say dust, I mean road dust. And then when the wind swapped the other way, we had the issue coming the other way. Now, when we talk about, uh, when we talk about additional fines, so if you have a look here, this is one of the slabs that were, that were demolished. And see all this blue stuff up here? That's actually raw tailings. So when we were demolishing some of the buildings, the buildings were actually constructed, uh, the concrete base wasn't just concrete. So they'd formed up the outside of the base, filled it full of tailings, and then built a house on top of it. Now, obviously you had to go somewhere, and that was in the ground. So for some scale, that there is the contain or one of the containment cells, and you'll notice some of the water sprays that we had set up, it was all automated. Essentially, if we picked up elevated levels of dust, uh, we would activate the water sprays on a continual basis. Essentially, it was like a mining operation, just in reverse. Now, when we talked about, someone talked about the media before, which is an interesting one. We had, a, we had an article in the, in the ABC, and it had a picture from a drone at a distance, and it looked like dust is coming out of our, our containment cell. It wasn't dust, it was water vapor. So essentially, when you get the right shot, it looks like dust, but it's actually those sprayers working at a distance. So it was quite interesting to see the sensationalism happening in the media. Um, again, 
different view of the, of the containment cell. Uh, cemetery access, one of the keys to this particular project as well, and I know I'm close to time, was there was a cemetery located just outside of town and that needed to be accessed um, and not blocked. So essentially we made space for someone to park and they could physically walk up, up to the cemetery. Now, when we talk about risks, um, there's not just the risk of actually doing the work, it's work associated with it. So essentially this particular vehicle was one of our pressurised vehicles. It was the second day at, towards the end of the job. It was a Sunday morning at about seven o'clock and had a phone call from one of my staff um, to say that they were involved in a vehicle accident. So this was fortunately outside of the Whitmoon Asbestos Management Area. The uh, driver had gone into town to put out their pumps and was driving back. He decided to um, unfortunately do a U-turn when there was a large amount of dust on the road and got T-boned by a truck. So essentially we had a phone call, flew up to the Pilbara and uh, extradited him back to Perth. So when we're looking at risk, um, travelling, uh, fatigue, all those associated issues um, are all part of the one picture about safe work. Um, and things sometimes do go wrong. That should be about it as well. Any quick questions, I think? Sorry to go through so fast, but there's a lot of data to go through. No, I think we're good. Ladies and gentlemen, please give your thanks to Sam. I guess, I guess if I've got one question, the day you left and the day your workers left, were you, were you really happy to see the back of the place? Well, we're back again in two weeks. Yeah? <laughs> so, so practical completion is two weeks' time. But yeah. look, I've, I've been involved in the Whitnoom area for about eight years yeah. on various types of projects. But, you know, doing the work and remembering the history of the town was, was pretty critical, considering so many people have been affected and passed away from this terrible, terrible disease. And, and do you think, and this is always that great challenge when you're talking about getting important messages through to the public via the media or other such things. Do you think people will continue to go to Whitman and will try and get past the signage and the history and will put themselves at risk? It's a lot harder now. Yeah. So essentially we've put in some pretty significant um, soil buns that are about three metres high to block that access and the purpose of that is predominantly to stop the caravanners. Um, it's very hard to get in there now but people will continue you know, because that's that's what people do with these inquisitive yeah. Type, yeah. type minds. But um, you know, children don't have a choice of what, what they're exposed to. Unfortunately, their parents take them to somewhere like Whitnoom to play, and that child doesn't have a choice. Yeah, of course. On, on, and they end up with an asbestos-related disease down the track. Yeah, and then we see the importance of the photos that we saw earlier, and I think everyone has seen those, those two little boys playing in those tailings. And, uh, and there's always the whatever happened to those kids and, and we know the answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. um, really very interesting and very important work, Sam. Thank you very much. Nice. And Josh, thank you to you as well.